Call a meeting to order. Uh, work session, Tuesday, May the 2nd, 2023. Uh, first item on the agenda is approval of the agenda. Do we have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. 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 <coughs> Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, next item, consent agenda and uh, ordinance 2023-011 grant project budget ordinance amendment for the Town of Woodman's American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, Shannon, I'll let you uh, explain that. Sure, thank you, Mayor. Um, that's a very simple cleanup uh, budget amendment. It's just as we close out fiscal year 23, we go back and look at where there might be tiny little discrepancies and um, the, the ARPA funding also kind of contributed to having to shift some things around. So you'll see it zeroes out. It's a zero effect, but um, just for auditing and accounting purposes, we're proposing this amendment. Okay, any questions regarding this item? Okay, all in favor of Approving this ordinance. Let it be known by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, and so to kick things off, uh, we'll move into the main portion of the agenda, which is the fiscal year 2024 uh, budget work session discussion. And I'm actually going to turn it over to Sherry. She's um, done the heavy lifting on this presentation, so I think she'll get us started. Thank you. Well, we're almost to the finish line with our FY24 budget. Um, today we'll, we'll do a brief overview. I always start with the slide showing kind of where we are in our overall budget process. And then we'll talk about expansion budget. We'll have a presentation from... Uh, the police department, Sergeant Ammons is here to provide some information. And then we'll close out by talking about the fee schedule and our um, fund balance update as how, how all the expansion items will affect our overall fund balance as we move forward. So in, in to, today, as I, the things that we've already done are grayed out. Um, we talked last time about capital projects and major programs like stormwater and streets and updated you all on our parks project. Um, today we'll focus on the items with the red circle. And then May 16th at your normal town council meeting this month, we'll um, present the recommended budget for next fiscal year and um, go over everything in, in detail at that time. So the proposed expansion budget, <clears throat> expansion budget represents anything that isn't in our base level budget from the prior fiscal year. So it, it can be one-time expenditures for capital or equipment or things that are not part of our routine operational procedures. Or it can be things that like additional staffing or additional programs that will raise the base budget level and be a recurring item as we move forward. Um, you'll see this list summarizes all the work that we've done to date and lists all the things that are not part of your operating base budget today. Um, the ones in red are one-time expenditures that won't have a continual impact year after year. And the items in green are recurring items that we um, will increase your base budget as we move forward and we'll have to fund year after year. If you break that down in dollars, um, I didn't go over each line because we're going to cover everything on that summary slide in detail and then I'll go back to that slide again at the end if you have any questions um, or want to provide feedback for staff. The one-time expenditures total $431,000 and then the recurring items total $286,746. Infrastructure was the first category on that summary slide. Um, you'll recall last month we made a presentation <clears throat> on streets 
talked about our capital project <coughs> that's been ongoing for the last year and a half. Uh, we're 90 something percent complete with that. We've finished 20 streets fully or partially paved to date. Um, and we have five more slated for completion in the next fiscal year. We added secluded forest drive since the last time we saw this in April. Um, <clears throat> financial impact, this was funded through debt service and you'll see that debt service schedule on the side. The reason that's included as part of your expansion budget, it's not really an expansion item, but it's something new that we haven't had in our to deal with in our budget previously. We approved the debt service. We've made one interest payment to date, but the, <clears throat> the main debt service payments will not start until next fiscal year. So that'll be a $229,000 impact on our general fund budget. All debt service resides in the general fund. So that's one thing that kind of took up a little bit of our discretionary money this year. Uh, we're recommending that we contribute our Powell Bill revenue. Powell Bill is reserved by the state, by state statute for streets and similar uh, expenditures. Uh, and also it'll, according to the quotes that we've gotten for the remaining five streets, we'll need to contribute an additional 31,000 from the general fund. So you saw that 31,000 on the first summary slide in red because it's a one-time amount. <coughs> and um, if there are no unforeseen things when we get into paving the streets, that should be adequate to get those streets done with what we have left in the fund. Any questions about that so far? <clears throat> the debt service was a 15 year issuance. We'll pay that down through 2038. We'll see that there. The other infrastructure item was stormwater. We've talked to the council extensively about stormwater, our MS4 permit, and federal, the unfunded federal mandate that we're under to take care of our stormwater infrastructure and provide a program to um, comply with their requirements moving forward. Our recommendation is to move that into a separate stormwater utility fund. There'll be a fee for all the parcels in the town and <clears throat> That'll be, so those costs will be gone from the general fund and it'll be in a separate standalone fund. We're estimating an 85% collection rate. We think that'll be pretty close to what we see as far as the bills. <clears throat> the one new thing that we didn't discuss previously and working through uh, a demo with our software provider and going through the logistics of how we are going to issue bills, mail bills, receive payments, post payments, do the banking, post the other. There'll be a lot of data entry for the um, nearly 3,000 parcels we have in the town. So we're requesting a part-time stormwater utility clerk that it'll be unbenefited position, salary and payroll taxes will amount to about $14,000 a year. So that's, that's where that's coming from. The fee structure Adrian went over last week increased just by a few cents per category because of that new position that we added in. And um, those are the amounts that you'll see in your stormwater uh, fee ordinance next time. The, and I think Ronnie asked at the last meeting what the annual, well, we think we're gonna bill annually, um, probably in August, if we're able to get this conversion done by then, we think we'll be able to hit that mark. Um, for the lowest level residential, Dental customer that's three twenty a month. That'd be thirty eight dollars and forty cents a year. Um, the next one ninety four fifty six, and then the six thousand to twenty one thousand um, feet of impervious surface would be one hundred and eighty nine dollars a year. So it it is an additional fee, but it's not going to have a huge impact on most of our residents. Commercial rates and the and the largest in that twenty one thousand. 500 plus feet residential category. I think we only had 14, is that right? 14 parcels that would be in there, so. Sherry, how are you gonna calculate that? I mean, like my piece of property, how do you know how many square oh, you're in that real, you're in that last tier right there. <laughs> <laughs> we contacted, we contracted with Land of Sky oh, to okay. do an impervious surface and they took it from, they used a combination of information 
Adrian's the guru of this, so I might get it wrong. Correct me if I get it wrong. They took the the GIS tax data and in their own. Um, I'm not sure what all else they used, but they calculated the impervious surface for each parcel for us. Yeah. What's the last month I asked about the gravel and that was considered like asked, is grass the same way? No, grass is not. Grass is, grass is not counted. Okay. So it'll be the footprint of the residents and driveways, I would take it. Residents, driveways, sheds. All, um, all, mm -hmm. all surfaces that water sheds off of, so Rooftops, paved surfaces, gravel. Gotcha. Okay. I, really, like my little old lot down there on the corner is all grass, so I won't be getting a bill for that. Okay. No. Um, the stormwater ordinance and the fee structure will be before you at the April at the May 16th meeting <clears throat> to review. We'll have a public hearing at the same time we do the budget public hearing at the same meeting in June, and then you'll make a final vote on that and correct. Okay. Any questions about stormwater? So um, although that doesn't have a general fund impact, it is a considered an expansion item, which is why we're addressing it again in this presentation. It's something not currently in our budget. Is that going to <clears throat> residents and businesses have to write a check or will there be an online payment link to use plastic? We are hope we don't have to take 3,000 checks or cash. That's we where it's are going through working my mind. <laughs> on a. Um, so we take credit card payments for things like park reservations and um, permitting fees and, and what have you. It's a little labor intensive the way we have to do it. So we're working with the uh, website provider to to come up with a easier way. We're hopeful to get that in place. The next category on the summary slide was parks and greenways. Um, as you're aware, last November we issued our second round of general obligation bonds for the park at one point million dollars. That's that last two columns of debt service information. So our GO bond payments that reside in the general fund will go up by 151,000 next year to a total of 395. Good bit of debt service in our general fund presently because of the projects that we have undertaken in the last few years but it's not we're still right within the normal range for a municipality in the budget size that we have um, just wanted you all to be aware the uh, 2022 geo bonds won't expire until 2038 it's the same year as the paving installment financing so we'll have both those debt payments with us for a few years Silver Line Park was the other um, item for this expansion discussion. We, we did a parks update at the last meeting. You all are aware of some of the uncertainties around our funding gap and other things. The one thing that we have to <clears throat> consider a priority because we're, we're obligated to put permanent restrooms at the Silver Line um, Park. With that building gone, we, we're hopeful that if we contribute another 100,000 to the 180 we currently have remaining in the park fund, we'll be able to provide permanent restrooms at that location. So we're requesting or we're recommending um, $100,000 in general fund proceeds be transferred to the park fund for that purpose. Sure, is the Park Rate Commission or the town, anybody looked into that yet to uh, get any ideas about the sewer? No. No, okay. My only concern is we're going to have to cut up that brand new parking lot. And I really hate to see that. Well, there's existing sewer lines in the sewer line where the building was. That's right. so it's only several... two inch. Yeah. So yeah. that's the problem. We put we the town had a brand new sewer line put in before the paving for that purpose mm -hmm. of the old building, and, but it's a two inch, um, which won't work for. A three-inch man or four-inch after it leaves the building <coughs> of um, toilet. Uh, the only way I mean, I just I hate to tear up a brand new parking lot that's only a year old. <laughs> yeah, that I'm sounds like what the state does. <laughs> they They'll pave a road and they dig it up. I know you, and you, you'd be a better judge of that than me. You've had a lot more experience in that area, but I hopefully they can 
board or to provide some other solution um, to maybe go the other way or something with that line since there's existing or old lines in there. You know, another thing MSD, we like to never got them talked into letting us run that two wing chat. We just have to see, I guess. Yeah. Those are things that would have to be worked out during the permitting. Any other questions about this one? So that's another one of the items in red, one time expansion expenditure of $100,000. Next category is vehicles and equipment. Um, you're all familiar with the police lease program of our vehicles. We have four new vehicles on order that are scheduled to be delivered sometime next fiscal year. <coughs> um, the delivery dates on those the last three years have been quite uncertain and taken a long time and we expect them probably in the spring of um, the next fiscal year. We have two, 22 vehicles in the current police fleet, 10 of which are currently under lease. So this will add four more and make 14 by the end of next fiscal year. So that's one item. We have a um, 2004 F-350 flatbed truck that the Public Works Streets Department uses. We have 75000 in the budget this fiscal year to fund a new truck, but we have not been able to purchase one because of um, trickle-down COVID <coughs> chip shortage. Now, in, especially in commercial trucks, there's a shortage, and every time one becomes available, um, they've closed the ordering for this year months ago. Every time one on the lot becomes available, it's gone that same day. And um, So we, if we are unsuccessful in purchasing one between now and August when the new uh, ordering is available, we'll order one next fiscal year. We anticipate an 11% increase. That's what the um, folks at the Sheriff's Association and the League are saying to anticipate in our budget. but. That's in there now, so if, if, if there is an increase in cost, we'll come back with a budget amendment request next fiscal year. Facilities. Um, town hall project we talked about at the last meeting. This fiscal year, we've concluded our RFQ process to select a, uh, a firm to do our feasibility, needs and feasibility study. Uh, we anticipate the conclusion of that uh, probably mid-December, January-ish next fiscal year, we hope. Um, the, we have 140000 in the budget today. Shannon's in negotiations now with that firm to, um, to, to, to hit that number. We're hopeful that we'll do that, but we'll, we're still negotiating with them on that. We have 300000 in the recommended budget today for the town hall project next fiscal year. Um, with the feasibility study concluding in the second or third quarter of next fiscal year, by the time we evaluate those results, you all make some decisions about where and size and what's included. And we put an RFQ out for design services. It'll be late in the fiscal year, and we don't anticipate spending much under that contract if we're able to get that underway next fiscal year. So that's where that number came from. Um, <clears throat> and then the, the subsequent fiscal, fiscal years will be, the, the cost will be dependent upon the decisions we make as a result of the RFQ. The other item under facilities is the salt storage shed. We have plans almost finished. Finished. finished and we are we'll solicit contractors and begin permitting and hopefully get this done in the fall we have 180,000 in the budget today we'll roll that over till next fiscal year whatever is unspent I don't think we'll start spending on that before the end of the fiscal year well, it's not red it's not new money it's already in there personnel um, this is where we get to the green numbers. Anytime we uh, recommend in adding an FTE to our staff or a part-time position, COLAs and, and other things that affect personnel become recurring costs because it affects the overall level of our budget. So we, we address those slightly differently. <coughs> in the recommended budget, and the police is gonna do a detailed presentation as to why 
these recommendations have been made. We have one new position. We're asking to include uh, a program for to provide on-call pay. The town has never done that. So our detectives and command staff that are on call at night and on weekends, anytime there is a serious event, they have to come back in at a moment's notice. So um, Jonathan will explain the, the details about that. Th those folks are uncompensated currently and um, we're asking to provide $20 a day in compensation for those that are on call for a number of reasons. And then a, a tuition <coughs> reimbursement program. We have that under police, but it will be, be available to any town and full-time employee that um, meets the requirements and wants to continue their education. Uh, the COLA, a lot of discussion around COLA, and I'll get to that next. Um, I have several slides and some information I've provided you on that. Shannon will talk about an excellence in service program that we'd like to include. And then, as I mentioned earlier, um, we've asked to add a part-time stormwater billing clerk, and the total cost would be around $14,000. Uh, when we talk about COLAs, and this slide may be in the wrong place, but we'll talk about it. The, a lot of discussion, as you can imagine, I, I made a statement to the board, to the council last fiscal year when we had the same meeting that in the 30 years I've been doing this, the 6% COLA we proposed last year was the largest that I've ever seen, and that's the truth. Um, the numbers are about the same this year as far as the CPI indexes and the, uh, although the environment is even tougher, and I'll, I'll explain why. The, the North Carolina League of Municipalities um, provides a lot of support for counties, cities, towns. They spend a lot of time doing surveys to see what the needs are of local government organizations. And one of the things that they do um, each year is a COLA and merit and benefit survey so that they do it in early budget season so that other, um, so that people across the state can see what their peers are doing and, and how the state as a whole are addressing these costs. Um, government entities are service organizations. We are all 70 or 80 percent payroll and, and benefits um, as far as our overall cost and it, it's because it's, it's, it takes people to do what we do and provide the services to the citizens. So it's always a big topic of discussion, especially now with the numbers that we see today. So statewide, um, I provided a it's not the colored PowerPoint, but the other handout that I gave you is a, a copy of the full survey reserve results for you. Um, Betsy, hold that one up. That, that's the one. Um, um, that's the full survey results. I pulled this slide from there, and it basically summarizes the COLA and merit increases statewide or between the averages are between 5 and 6.4%. Um, the range is anywhere from zero to 18 percent. Um, so for municipalities, I like their survey because they break it down by size. So you can look at a peer group that is the same size as, as your government. So if you look at the 5,000 to 999 group, that's us. Our population is a little over 8,000. Um, the average is between, the lower average is 5 percent, the high average is 6.4 percent. So that's some data for you. We also surveyed our peers that are close to home. The city of Asheville this year is requesting a 5% for most of their employees and 6% for all sworn law enforcement. Uh, Biltmore Forest is 5.6 to 6% is what they're requesting. Black Mountain, 4%. Um, Buncombe County, is, is they use the same index that we do, but they do a two-year average. So this year their COLA will be 7.28%. Uh, Weaverville has a merit-based system only, and they are requesting 5 to 6% merit increases for staff. Hendersonville, 5%. The Land of Sky Regional Council is 7%. Brevard, 5%. And uh, Woodfin is, uh, our recommendation is 4% for exempt employees. That's your higher paid staff members that are not hourly. 
um, <coughs> department directors uh, and the chief, who's also the department director. <laughs> sure. We've talked in previous council meetings about the benefits of a merit system. Have y'all had any more discussions internally about how to do that? We've talked quite a bit, uh, Sherry and I have talked quite a lot about the pros and cons of merit versus COLA or looking at both. Um, I think it's the next slide. Um, I was going to talk about a merit-based program okay. that we're proposing to have. Great, thank you. Or not the next slide, but after the COLA Okay, discussion. appreciate it. Okay. Um, on that topic, Councilman, the uh, PowerPoint presentation that I gave you all, I, I attended a recent League of Municipalities training um, that they do across the state. They go to each region and have meetings. And one of the things that they said was the largest problem this year is staffing statewide, really nationwide. Um, everybody is short of staff. You know, we, we struggle to hire folks. We've had police openings all year. Um, Woodfin really is in a better position to mo than most of our neighbors. You, you know, if you look at the website for the city or the county, there are tons of positions in every department open and really puts a huge burden on the other staff. And there's a lot of talk about that industry-wide this year. The league did an exceptional job in the presentation, and that's one of the reasons that I copied you, those, you on those slides is that um, there's so much discussion, so much headhunting going on around the street for qualified folks that if, you know, seven or eight years ago when I posted a, a position at the state, I'd have 100 applicants in two days. No, no kidding, 100 of them. HR would have to do a spreadsheet to narrow them down to the most qualified because I can't look at 100 applications and really do it justice. Today, we post an application and in a week, we're lucky to get two applicants. Neither of which are probably real qualified, but it, it's just a, such a different environment and um, really a concern for everyone in this industry. And those slides are provided for your review. They do a good job talking about where everybody is around the state and why those are statistics or real issues for the state. This next slide, um, Continue, continuing on with the COLA discussion breaks down um, our organization. Today our total payroll is $2,076,000. If you look at the benefits that uh, go along with that, it's 2.7, almost $2.8 million. So a COLA is, is not small change for us. We don't take the recommendation lightly. 4% uh, would cost the town. If we just did a flat 4% for everyone, $109,000. That includes all the benefits that are affected by salary rates. 6% would be 166,000 and 7% would be 193,000 over what we pay today if all of our positions are full for the whole year. Uh, we're recommending that um, we also provide an $18 an hour minimum wage. Currently, you all approved a $17 last year. Um, Just Economics says the living minimum wage in Buncombe County today is $20.10. There's been a lot of new press about that. Uh, Buncombe County is also recommending a seven, an $18 an hour minimum and they're committing to their 3% a year until they get up to that $20 for their lower paid employees. If we approve that $18, we only have one employee that if we provide a 6% COLA will be below that by a few cents. and our request would be to raise that person up to $18. Um, so the recommendation before you is 4% for exempt staff, 6% for all other staff members. There's only five, six exempt positions in the town. Any questions, discussion about that? Good job. Okay. Did you want to talk about this? I do have one question, I guess. <clears throat> if the difference between, and, and this, if I'm reading this correctly, is only 13992 why would we not go ahead and, in light of what we're talking about of keeping our staff, and why would we not put everybody at 6% and figure out that 13000 
It's <clears throat> well, you'll see when we get to the end of this presentation. Okay. We're, All right. We're, we're a little bit. Will be answered later. We're a little bit in the red, and so okay. we're trying to look at every opportunity for savings. And so there's two reasons. One is we're trying to prioritize. Um, salary increases for our lowest paid staff. Certainly. So trying to put a little bit more emphasis on that. We would like to study the pay scale a little bit more in this coming year. So having that little bit of extra salary savings kind of helps give us a little um, room to, to adjust some of those lowest paid people to try to bring them up to a, a better living wage. Um, that's one reason. The other reason is when you look at the salaries for those six people, um, or for those six positions, there's a pretty big gap between the highest six and, and the lowest six. And um, controlling costs over long term for the town. When you start doing COLA year after year, you start to kind of see those higher end salaries because the base is so much higher. Right. It grows higher. So th that's the main reason. It, it, we recognize it's not a big salary savings. We looked at this last year, and because the salary savings wasn't very significant, we you know, decided not to, to recommend that. But this year, particularly with the living wage increase, we thought it might be helpful. Thank you. I, th I think you said, Mingo, how many employees was, is the 4% affected? Uh, I believe it's six positions. Six? Five or six, let's see. It's finance director, town manager, police chief, planning director, project manager, and public works director. Six. six. Everybody else is 6%. Everybody else gets 6 <clears throat> I don't understand what she's saying about the increase. I just want to keep our 6 <laughs> You know, 30000 versus 100000 that's a lot. The, the other thing, and this, is, this goes to the conversation about merit versus COLA, um, is one of the things we try to take into consideration is um, the, the, the cost of labor in our area. And where we've seen the greatest growth in cost of labor is in the lowest, like the labor um, positions. So our lowest positions. Those are the individuals who could most easily leave and find equal or higher pay in another organization. I don't think it's quite as true. There's a lot of opportunity everywhere, to be honest. But um, it's not quite as tempting for those um, six for the six exempt positions, I think, as it is for the other, you know, 32 positions. Okay, ready to move on? All right. So, um, as part of that conversation about merit and COLA, COLA we feel is, yeah, you know, I'll be honest, when I was a staffer, I was uh, much more interested in a merit pay based system. You know, I work hard, I want to be recognized for my work, I see people not working as hard, they're getting the same increase, that doesn't seem fair. But as a supervisor manager, you definitely develop a different perspective. Um, there is uh, an equity fairness component to COLA. Um, there is some challenges related to administering a merit-based system. Um, and, uh, and as I mentioned, the, the, the labor issue, you know, if we, if we don't do what we can to retain the individuals that we have, um, we will be hurting ourselves, and COLA definitely is an important <coughs> benefit that employees look for. Uh, so rather than get rid of COLA or replace it with a merit system, we're proposing to add what we call the excellence in service, and that's just the name I came up with. It doesn't have to be called that, but it's a one-time bonus performance-based system. So we would develop criteria. Um, I've seen this done in other towns. Asheville has something like this. Um, and other municipalities do as well, but you develop criteria and tiers for recognition. So depending on the contribution or that employee's performance and, you know, in different <coughs> aspects of their work, they can be nominated for additional compensation. So um, that would range anywhere from 50 to $1,000, depending on what it was that they did. They can be nominated by a coworker. They can be nominated by a supervisor, but it gets reviewed. If it's nominated by a coworker, the supervisor and the town manager will review it, um, but I'll review all of them. So we're recommending to add $10,000 to the 
budget. It's a green item, so that means it would be a recurring cost if the council supports this new program. But it would be a way for us to recognize excellent performance of some of our staff. Um, there's nothing magic about the $10,000 number. We just um, had to start somewhere. And you know, as a new program, we felt like that was a reasonable place to start. And we could reevaluate that you know, based on what we receive in the coming year. But this is a way for us to kind of combine the benefits of a merit-based system without creating the budget impact that a percent of salary merit system would would generate. I, mean, I personally kind of like the pat on the back, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it can be everything from, boy, this citizen, you know, had great things to say, you know, here's $50, $100, to like, wow, you really knocked it out of the park with that in-depth detailed study that you did we recognize that additional hours of work that you put in here's a thousand dollars so um, that's that's the goal yes sir it, would this um, officer of the year still remain separate or would it become part of this we can look at that we haven't established the criteria yet we have some models that we can look at um, but that's something we could look at I, I would want to give the maximum benefit um, just, how much does that officer what does that what does that monetary reward represent? Uh, I think, is it about $500? Yes. Yeah, $500. So that could be one of the criteria. It could just be Officer just of the Year, curious. automatic, $500. Yeah. Sounds kind of low for Officer of the Year, personally, but. Oh, we can potentially bump it up. Um, I was just curious. Yeah. yeah. And also, Officer of the Month, you know, that could be another automatic qualification for some other um, bit of compensation. This is good. That's a good idea. At least in my history, managing you can really you can really motivate some people that wouldn't get any recognition, uh, and it doesn't take a lot of money. Just sometimes the recognition and the hundred dollar bill or check is a can be a big deal. So, good I, idea. I also wanted to mention um, we are. I'm also uh, studying different performance evaluation processes. I've recognized the town hasn't had a consistent system. I know different departments have done their own performance evaluation um, uh, uh, processes that they've, they've kind of done on their own. I'd like to look at trying to do something um, town-wide for all of the staff, and there may be some specific pieces that might be unique to different departments, but um, generally I'm, I am looking at that. The movement is to move away from the annual sit down for two hours, go over all, all everything you've done in the last year, um, and do what we call like monthly check-ins or regular check-ins with staff where it's more of a mentoring structure. And this is something with all of the conversation and attention on recruitment and um, and retention that is happening now. There are multitudes of workshops, webinars, sessions, um, presentations, luncheons, things being offered by the League of Municipalities, the School of Government. And a lot of those are talking about what makes the workplace more comfortable. How do you create a rewarding workplace environment? And one of those things is creating more of a mentoring structure. So that's something that we're looking to try to build with that evaluation process. And including in that, before it was always, as you say, the sit down, it was the top down. And I think shifting that to starting with the bottom up yeah. and then the sit down. And that's what a lot of these check-ins kind of focus on, is checking in with that employee on a, on a regular basis saying, so how are things going? I remember last month you were struggling with this. So do you feel like, you know, and are you getting the support you need? And how do we give you that support? So that's the goal of these, these check-ins. These are great questions. Any, anything else? I like it. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan. Um, you all, several of you, participated in our PBL presentation. Jonathan was one of our PBL members, and he's here representing the group to kind of share a little bit more about the group's recommendations and how some of those have filtered into our budget discussion today for the expansion cases. <coughs> Thank you all for the opportunity to come and talk to you today. <clears throat> so PBL, I know you've seen that passed out through here. It's our problem-based learning group. Uh, surveys were sent out to the officers to kind of 
gauge what their um, perceptions were on recruiting, retention, and communication within the agency. So we as a group sat down um, with Sheriff Duncan and Chief Presley and, and we polled every officer in the agency to come up with these recommendations and that we're going to be presenting to you. So that kind of touches on a little bit on the PBL group as it's abbreviated to save time there. Um, and the uh, recommendations that we'll go through uh, will be prioritized based on cost, cost savings for the town um, with the evaluation. Um, focused on the recruiting and retention and communication because those are very important to our officers and the department moving forward. And it will also help us to be able to establish goals to move forward with working with the community instead of having that, you know, being separate. We want to be united with the community. Can yeah. for a Absolutely. So for, I know I've explained this to you all before in our weekly updates, but just to clarify, PBL stands for problem-based learning, and this was an exercise that we did voluntarily in the department to identify problems. So first the group where the department really sits down and identifies what the problem that we want to study is. And that was determined to be recruitment and retention. So these recommendations are focused on recruitment and retention. Sorry. Sorry. All right. So to begin, as you'll see, uh, this is our current rank structure and organizational chart throughout our uh, police department. It starts with the chief of police and over to the lieutenant. And the lieutenant, um, as well as the chief, they oversee investigations as well as all of patrol. Um, and as we move forward and looking at the future, we would recommend adding the captain's position and uh, potentially in the future, if you know, funding is available, potentially adding a second lieutenant to be able to help oversee investigations and, and training. Are you going to explain what the job duties of a captain would be as I will. opposed to? I would. Okay, absolutely. Good. So the duties of the, duties of the captain, uh, position will carry out duties of the highest ranking officer underneath the chief of police. Uh, that will assist the chief by handling administrative duties and I will go on further as we move through the presentation to explain some more about uh, some of the administrative duties and, and, and things like that. They will oversee the agency, you know, monitoring uh, not only the, the lieutenant below and the sergeants, but kind of just making sure that they have an oversight of the agency rather than in their day-to-day -day operations as they move forward. Um, they will ensure that communication flows up and down. Um, sometimes anybody that's worked at a job, sometimes you can see that communication may not flow as well as it. So that, that's one of their priorities as well, is to make sure that we're having that proper information flow coming up from the patrol officers all the way up to the chief and back down, working with not only the chief, but with the other rank and file. Um, they will handle report submissions. So we have a lot of submissions that have to be sent to the state and to the federal government. Um, so they'll be helping spearhead some of that with some grant proposals that will help our agency and kind of offset some of the costs um, for funding that's available to the agency. As well as working with permissions, administrative testing that has to be done annually and, and things like that. So we actually uh, went through and, and surveyed some other agencies looking at what they have when we looked at you know, recommending this, this captain's position. And we focused on agencies that were comparable to Woodfin. So not just looking at Buncombe County or, or the city, but looking you know, at, at departments that were similar to Woodfin. So as you can see here, we, we looked at Weaverville Police Department, Black Mountain, Waynesville, Fletcher Police Department and Marion Police Department. We looked at these departments and we tried to set up benchmark comparisons. How does Woodfin compare to these other um, agencies? And it will break down in the next slide a little bit, but I kind of wanted to just glance at this and show you a little bit um, 
six agencies, including Woodfin on there. Um, when we look at the different sections that we broke down, the first was population size. Um, the second was land area, full-time employees, non-sworn employees, command staff, and patrol staff. Um, Woodfin Police Department on population size, as the numbers are here, which you know how those can be, they can go up and down, uh, ranked third um, amongst the six organizations. Woodfin was first in, in land size, so we had the, of the agencies polled, we had the highest uh, amount of land to cover. Our full-time employees is uh, 19 full-time employees, um, that would put us at at fifth out of the uh, out of the six, um, we looked at non-sworn employees. We are um, tied for last with Weaverville Police Department on that one. Um, and when we looked at command staff, we were also tied with Weaverville Police Department. With Can you two. Yes. Uh, define sworn and command staff, if you would. Okay, so what does mean? Sworn employees means anyone who has been through basic law enforcement training and has been sworn in as a police officer, and that's from the chief of police down. Um, when we look at non-sworn employees would be like our evidence custodian who handles that, but is not as an actual sworn officer. Uh, and then command staff, as we look at it, would be anything lieutenant or higher. Um, our patrol staff is including our patrol sergeants, such as what I do, and, and below all the way down to the day-to-day -day officers who make the difference there. Um, and when we look at, um, did I explain command staff? Well, I think we're tied with Weaverville there. I think I did say that. And then finally, when we look at patrol staff, uh, the police department is tied at, at fifth. Do you have any idea why Waynesville is such an outlier? And FTE. Uh, just Wayne's, curious. Wayne's they have their own dispatch. Huh? Yeah. They have their own dispatch. That's the uh, all those uh, non sworn officers. They have their own dispatch center. So that's it. a big portion of them. But they also just have a uh, for their how their community is set up with that downtown and kind of being the kind of county seat for for uh, Haywood County. They they have more officers. Okay. Thank you. So. This kind of goes into what I've already talked about a little bit. Um, you can see, you know, we kind of work from the inside out there, Buncombe County agencies being the closest to Woodfin on that chart and then moved out to agencies outside of Buncombe County, but we're similar. Uh, same amount of population or more than other agencies with fewer number of officers uh, in smaller population, agencies with smaller population. Their command staffing levels are actually lacking compared to some other agencies in and around Buncombe County. And the additions that we will re recommend moving forward will actually help us to kind of move out of being deficient and, and work towards enhancing the agency, so gaining ground. So the next, when we talk about why do we need a captain? Well, the Woodfin Police Department, our PBL group, pulled all officers, like I talked about earlier, and they actually decided that, first things first, we need another administrative position that that would help serve our needs better than just creating other roster spots. We need to make sure that we're retaining the officers that we have and getting the recruiting for new officers coming in. Section two is it allows the supervisors that are actually already working day to day better, uh, more time to be able to adequately supervise their employees. Um, when you have, and we'll talk about this a little bit more with all the administrative duties that are given out, you know, we have just as many or, or almost as many as some of the larger agencies as far as administrative duties that have to be carried out with a much smaller command staff. So those, those duties get delegated out to uh, lieutenants, sergeants, uh, investigators, and patrol officers. Can you talk about what some of the duties are? Yeah, there, there are duties such as um, ordering, um, turning in all of the um, different um, forms and and surveys and studies that have to be sent to the state and the federal government 
um, handling any equipment that gets broken. You've got to make sure that officers are being tested and handling all of their in-service duties and things like that. I mean, there are there are tons of them. Reporting um, metrics. Reporting metrics. Yeah. Munitions, Every, there's just a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. Is, is this going to play a role in getting more officers trained in different things? For example, like being able to use radar. Um, it will allow us to um, move forward and, and keeping people here instead of losing people that are already trained in radar. And as well as we keep people here, uh, it will allow officers to go to training more regularly than if we're having to cover shifts and, and move on and move forward. So that's where we've fallen into um, being deficient on allowing training because we don't have adequate shift coverage. So working on retaining those officers here is what we want to work towards. And we do still have those vacancies. So we anticipate that once we fill those vacancies, we will have adequate shift coverage. And then that will free up a lot of people. And also it's going to encourage um, our officers as they have less of those administrative duties and things to actually get out in our community more you're not tied to a desk to try to get these things done. You can get out and have a greater presence in our communities. Um, they will be able to work uh, outside the agency to help recruit um, new officers coming in. I mean, we've already had some of the officers going to job fairs and, and different things that has been rather new to us. We haven't really had that going on. And, and then recently we've, we've started doing that and trying to expand on what we do. Um, it encourages a direct line of communication, as we talked about before, uh, and, and eases the load of the administrative duties. But finally, what I want to talk about is it assists in implementing new programs as well, such as data analysis, and I think um, Ms. Tuck talked about that. And uh, for some examples of this is uh, traffic stop data and grant processes. Uh, those, um, having someone to spearhead those, sorry. Uh, those assignments and making sure that all the data is collected, everything's put out there the way that it needs to be, and then working on those grants can be extremely time-consuming. So in, instead of rather having you know sergeants or other people spend a lot of time on that, we're able to um, allocate that to. And I think the job fairs that you all went to were at Appalachian State and at Western Carolina. Yes. So they're going, you know, for <laughs> degree. Mm -hmm. degreed folks so, and it actually had an applicant didn't yes. you from that from one of those two yeah so john would that be a, a shift ordinated position or would it be eight to five or it would be more of an eight to five position um, because a lot of the administrative duties uh, need to be carried out during that time frame because that's when most of your other businesses are going to be open so the communication levels between them and state and federal agencies and things like that would need to be carried out during the day do you anticipate being able to fill this position from within that would be our hope um, obviously that would probably be a little uh, decision higher than my pay grade but I, I would expect that that would be something that we definitely have the uh, the knowledgeable uh, officers already in place that could yeah. easily step in I wanted to hear that for you well I can tell you that I, I have full trust and uh, in our officers that are here that can move directly into that position Great. so good um, all right, if there are not any other questions, we'll move forward. Um, this is kind of a breakdown of what we were talking about with the administrative duties. Um, it's an estimate of nearly 100 administrative duties that are critically important to the agency that are you know, distributed out. So as we've talked about that a lot, it's too much for you know, just the chief and lieutenant to handle alone. So they're distributed out um, to the sergeants, investigators, and even patrol officers to handle even, you know, maintenance on uh, vehicle cameras and other things like that. So uh, it will help with that. And as we move forward, we're going to look at, go ahead. No, I just realized I forgot to put it in the papers of where we're from. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> That's my fault. That's all right. Um, so we want to look at what's on the what's on the horizon, what's in the future for Woodfin Police Department and the town of Woodfin. Um, so some of the trends that we're already observing uh, is the police department will see an increase of resources needed. Um, 
we've got to be able to address these things such as vandalism, vagrancy, uh, the increased amount of traffic that's going to roll through town causing motor vehicle collisions. Um, because we have, you know, up to hundreds of thousands of people that travel through Woodfin every day and not only uh, on the interstates, but coming to see our parks. Um, I was actually on a social media the other day and somebody got mixed up. They thought that the city of Asheville Park was our new Silver, Silver Lawn Park. And they said, Asheville sure has some pretty parks. And I just wanted to comment, it's Woodfin. But um, <laughs> we have 5.2 miles of French Broad River. And that's a ton of ground to cover. Um, uh, we have um, some unknown, some unknown <laughs> acres of Riverfront <laughs> Park and uh, 5.1 miles of Greenway. And then um, of our future I-26 in the U.S. route, we have 4.25 miles um, that runs through our jurisdiction. So with adequate staffing levels, we'll obviously be better to uh, prepared to handle these situations. And, and, you know, I realize another thing, not, not, it's not that, so what we have listed here are things that kind of make us a little bit unique from other municipalities, but there are other trends too. Like we, we are experiencing an increase in population and not all communities are, but we are. So in addition to having to monitor and address all of these things that make us somewhat unique, we are also dealing with the, the natural growth trends. So we have increasing population, increasing demands based on that as well. Absolutely. So I talked about earlier about our, our agency's partnership with the community. Um, so we, we wish to, to further grow that. And we, we've done some of these things in the past, but we want to look to not only bring these and start them back up, give them, you know, because of COVID, we really uh, took a step back of that, you know, with the social distancing and everything like that. But we really want to get back into it. Um, so, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I, maybe you want me to save the question. I've been approached by two members of your force recently, uh, coincidentally, asking how they can get involved at the, at the elementary school and if the town has plans to get more involved. Would this be part of that? We do. Um, we, we currently have um, day shift officers who spend a pretty significant amount of time over there with not only with the school crossing, and, and there are some slides on this next one that will okay, show okay. that. But yes, we're, we want to be able to expand upon that. We do uh, a minimal amount over there right now, and I think part of that's due to staffing, but we want to be able to have some coordinated um, events as well instead of just sporadic sending officers over there when they want to. We want to have actual um, coordinated events to have officers go over and actually help you know Good. establish that relationship with the children. So this was, um, yeah, I think we've talked about it. the other part of this is uh, Community cleanup, we want a partnership with the community to actually clean up. So officers working with members of the community uh, to, to do some cleanup and then social interactions with the community. Um, when we talk about our community engagement, this is some examples here. We've had shop with a cop and we'll, I'll go from left to right here. Um, reading to the children, um, eating lunch with the kids at school. I mean, that still goes on. The, the lunches have changed a little bit from when I was in school, but they're, <laughs> they're still good. That's so. a big deal over yeah, there, though. Exactly. Big deal. Exactly. Especially Pizza Day. Everybody loves Pizza Day. <laughs> the next one is Community Day. Um, I've had the privilege of uh, organizing a couple of those events, and we still go out to different churches and schools in the community and for their Community Days, but I think it's important, uh, and we think it's important to get that going back up again and doing our own um, safety day where everyone gets to come out and ex you not only you know get to meet our officers but kind of figure out what we do a little bit and have a good time and then finally you'll see uh, chief docs there at the woodson 5k where he <laughs> ran it in full uniform what was your time chief slow no <laughs> his slow was my fast when i wasn't in uniform yeah, mine was 30 minutes when I ran it. I, I was like a turtle running through peanut butter. So. Um, the next, <laughs> those were some examples. So additionally, you know, as I talked about at the beginning in the introduction, you know, our, our group worked on an assortment of recommendations. Uh, these are going to be the recommendations that we, you know, put in front of you based on the, the cost that we can um, 
handle the expansion. Um, two other things that, that uh, Sherry talked about a little bit was the on-call pay and the uh, cost share education reimbursement for not only officers but for town staff and that's what I want to get into next. Um, our on-call pay is our criminal investigations and non-salary administrators. Um, you know, you can look at um, our detectives that are on call nearly 185 days a year, 80 to 185 days a year without compensation where they can't leave a certain amount of distance from the town and be able to respond quickly uh, as well as, you know, lieutenant and chief for that matter because he's, he's on there but as salary. Um, but you have to have your phone on. You have to be able to not only answer questions, sometimes you might not have to come in, but be able to answer questions and then if you do need to respond, you can get back in there quickly. And this picture that you'll show to the right, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but, uh, but I do want to kind of expand upon it a little bit. Um, this is talking about the hypervigilance cycle, okay, and, and some of you may be familiar with this, but while you're on duty, you're alive, alert, energetic, kind of like you see me right now, so, you know, um, and then a normal person, when they get off of work and they go home, they go into that normal range. They're relaxed, they're with their family, um, but it, studies have shown that when officers and first responders go home, sometimes it can take up to 24 hours for them to get into that normal risk zone where uh, normal people would be able to go right into that normal risk zone fairly quickly after getting home. Um, so when you have someone who is on call and is going from that position of on and off duty and answering calls and going up and down, you uh, really uh, set that person up for some substantial health risk and other things that, that have to be, um, but we have to have that service. We have to have officers who are on call to be able to, to come out with specialties. Is the on-call pay not happening now? No. So this would be brand new? Yes. And, and many other agencies are doing this, um, and but this is just a way of kind of offsetting that a little bit. It's also a simple thing of, you can't go out to dinner and have a beer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you can't, you can plan on dinner or you can go to a movie and you can guarantee you're going to get called out. Yeah. You know, so you're always taking your family in two cars yeah. to events. There are just so many pieces to it um, that really affect not only the officer but their family. Is well. it just detectives that are on call? No, no not necessarily. So if, but if, not the whole force. Everybody whole force. does it. So just if, if okay. the captain position uh, were to be approved, that would also be. And the other part of that is if the captain's position is approved, that we could be able to break up the on-call scheduling to allow officers, you know, a week on at a time and two weeks off, mm -hmm. and then that would give them more time to reach that normal range after work and to have an ex extended amount of time to have be a beer with their with supper exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, wow. I, well, I personally seen john before sit down at blood shows and they up. just set his plate down he's got to get up off that's the line right. leave it set and and that's something that we all deal with every every day and but it happens but it, it, and it adds up over a 30-year career as you you know and i'm getting i'm just now reaching my 18th year so it, it adds up after a while so it'll be twenty dollars a day is that twenty dollars a day yeah is that enough is that comparable with what other it's, horses it's, pay yeah it's basically what everybody pays or something similar do you agree with that councilwoman what's the so the city of Asheville is going from 20 to 30 this year and i don't know what the county does I'm just asking. The sheriff's office was down in actually dollars okay. two years ago. I have to check and see if they changed that. I mean, for recruiting and retention, if if, if you need, I never got it. So you need yeah. more. <laughs> <laughs> you need yeah. more. Ask for more. We are, uh, this is critical. Yeah, and yeah. the sheriff's office didn't have it until a few years ago either. Right. Well, if you're saying twenty is a good way to get started, that's great. But if you if you're finding that it's helping, don't hesitate to come back to Shannon and say. Get more money. Since it's new, I would recommend maybe that we start at 20 and, and continue to study and evaluate. Okay, good. Now, would exempt employees like the chief get that? No. 
No. See, that, that's the problem I have. We were exempt for years, Jerry and I. I didn't ever get called out much, but I did get called out some, a uh, car in a house or yeah. whatever. But uh, we didn't get paid for that. But, but with that said, I had a director that if 3 o'clock tomorrow I wanted to go home, he'd never said anything. So I made it up in a roundabout way, if that makes any sense. But an officer can't do that. Right. I just... Johnson, if you're on call, let's say you're on call tonight. Right now you get called back, you don't get anything for it. Are you on the clock once you get called and yes. come back to work? Yes. So you're getting paid for the actual yes. work right. time, yes. just not the on call time. Yes. Okay. So once you once you get called in, then your your time starts, um, and the entire time that you're there, and then, um, but you like I like I said before, you might receive a call at two o'clock in the morning and be completely asleep. And now you're up having a 20 to 30 minute conversation, you know, with someone about a situation that you may not end up coming in. And but now you're you're dealing with that and then you're looking at an hour to so to get able to get wound back down to go to back to sleep. Um, so I think that's kind of the emotional uh, stress that kind of goes along with it and having a having to keep a go bag with you when you're going out and and things. But yes, you are once you are called in. Mr. Mayor, you are uh, compensated from. Are there certain way to, to make a sworn officer exempt from the exempt pay to where, like the chief could get the $20 if he was to get called in? Does that make sense? I'm first on this one. I'm on call 365. Right, right. You know, so that, that's, uh, you know, my salary compensates for the fact that I am on call all the time. So I'm not worried about this for me, uh, but for the uh, lieutenant and the investigators who are, you know, again, they they try to have that normal family life and know yeah, but you got to have family life too. Call. And I understand, it, like John, he's on call too, 24/7, basically. Uh, but anyway, I just I hate that the chief don't get in on this. <laughs> there was another recommendation from the PDL that looked at higher when shift coverage had to happen, when, when our patrol officers had to cover other shifts because people were out. Sure, reason, sure. They had another recommendation that looked at compensating those individuals, and that, and that I think might be getting at a little bit more of what you're thinking right, about. Right, right. But the, the challenge with that is not only was there a higher budgetary impact, but it it's, it's kind of an innovative approach. And we like innovation, but we don't want to be cutting edge necessarily. And so we want to take a little time and, and look at that okay. more and, okay. you know, and see if that's something we want to consider. And the officers involved in this discussion support these things. I'm yes. good. We, we all met um, and had a, a, you know, a discussion with the chief and most everybody here and, and kind of talked about what, how we would prioritize what we would bring to you today. So it's not necessarily that we don't want to look in the future of possibly doing more, but just as far as right now, these were our top items that we, we wanted to, it, it to was a, And it was a combination of what was prioritized by the PBL group, but also looking at what realistically our budget could support. So it was kind of looking at both. I mean, we would love to come in with all of the recommendations, <coughs> but it's just not and this one also, with the on-call pay and the one week on, two off, goes toward health, safety, um, the ability to do your job well. Um, there's just a whole lot of pieces to it. Okay. So I think it's a great start. Yeah, they the group members work really hard on coming up with all this. So very proud of them. I, I just remember back in the chief, you too, yeah. Jonathan. When we was having staffing trouble, big staffing trouble, and y'all, all of y'all were working t three shifts a day, shift, if that makes any <laughs> sense. And we had some officers get burned out, and I understand that. And um, I, I, I don't want to sit that out again. We don't either. And, and that was part of the um, working towards, you know, the addition of the captain's position is being able to allow us to 
establish that rapport with each officer and check base with them and mentor them and make sure that they're not getting to that point of burnout and then also allowing them adequate time to be able to take time off and to spend that time with their family and recoup and they'd be able to come back into work and be effective and also to work towards your succession planning absolutely too. that's a big piece of it as well those are awesome questions thank you all um, I'm almost finished here. Uh, the next one was education cost share program. Um, one of the things that we talked about was partner, partnering with uh, Western Carolina University uh, as a part of the NC Promise program. Uh, I'm currently a uh, student at Western Carolina and I'm doing the distance learning to get my bachelor's uh, with criminal justice. It's around $600 a semester. Um, but it wouldn't just be for the police officers. We would expand that out to where, you know, qualifying uh, members of the town staff would also be able to uh, be a part of that. And I think um, Sherry has some more figures on that that should go over later. But uh, it will help us to have better educated officers, more rounded, and be more knowledgeable when they get out there to be able to um, actually be able to uh, handle, their, <laughs> handle their job a little bit better and, and more understanding of the law. and and what uh, what they can do. Any questions? Excellent. All right. and this is just a conclusion breaking down what we've already done, so I don't think you need to repeat that, but thank you all. Will this process continue to be ongoing? It's not a project that happened and will never end, right? Problem-based learning? The, the goal of, yeah, no, but I think that the, the idea of the ongoing But the idea also would apply if you wanted to work externally with other community partners on identifying sort of a community challenge and working together to So them. you'll be back in what six months to give us an update on is it working and if that's what you would all I would love to come back. I would love to have the rest of my group members to come back as well and oh, I, I absolutely want that. Give yes. you an update. Yes. And, and there are a number so it's because this is in the context of the budget, you know, these are all recommendations that have budgetary impacts, right. but um, there were a good number of recommendations that had nothing to do with budget necessarily, um, that were just things that the, the group wanted to um, see us try to try to do more. And so I think and those are happening. More. Some yeah. of them are happening? Some of those are starting to happen, yeah. Okay, good. Especially the cost-free ones, we're already getting started on that. And you may have noticed out here, we, we cleaned up a little bit outside. Uh, we came out and spent, was it seven hours a couple of Saturdays ago, pressure washing the building and and different things like that and, and making sure the gutterings were cleaned out and everything. So just trying to, to make a better first impression, try to clean up and, and just be a better part of the community. The next time you do an event like that, make us aware of it. You you might, some of us you might even show up to help. Okay. It'd be fun to get to know the force as well. We did. We sure did. Did you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but it got changed because of yeah. weather, the weather and rescheduled and yeah. And I well, will say well, that you know at my age it's harder to remember. <laughs> <laughs> I will say when the initial I was had the pleasure of listening to the officers report initially, which was not just the financial piece, but each of the four who were on this committee had a part in the presentation. Um, everybody was fully invested and it was just really great and well done. Thank you very much. And John Warp actually, he, I spray, he even surprised me. <laughs> there, there was a lot of work by our group members. Um, they met at, almost every week for months. From, I believe it was either the end of December, 1st of January until uh, middle of March. Yeah. And it was sometimes one to two times a week for three to four hours at a time and then work afterwards. Well, that's why we want we want to hear how it's working because if, mm -hmm. if you put that much effort into this, we want to know the results. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, back to the expansion budget. This uh, is the same slide you saw earlier in the presentation. And we, we've talked about all these points. So you have a little bit more information on um, where we are with that. So the overall recommendation by staff is to include this 717,000 
in our budget. Um, yes, come back and make a plate. We've got plenty of food. <laughs> for next year so we'll have a question a question and answer session at the end or there's a few more slides for us to cover unless there's something specific you want to go over now shoot one and this is probably way out of reach uh once the storm water gets up and going and my fees ten dollars a year or whatever is that something that could be added to the tax bill like Whooping tax now, or is that something that the town's going to continue building? So, so our, our our first choice was to add this fee because we don't have another utility. We don't provide water services or right. electricity. So, um, for the small staff we have to bill every single customer or parcel in the town is is a bit of a heavy lift. Sure. Um, we wanted to put that on the tax bill, but the county wasn't able to facilitate that this year. Right. We need to start that this year, so we. Um, are working with our software provider to, to do that. Okay. We, we're going to continue discussions with the county and if it's possible to move that over to them in, in a subsequent fiscal year, we'd like to do that. Okay. Um, I was just curious. Yeah, so we're, we're going we're gonna to continue to follow that path. Um, one of the issues is, is there are legislative rules around the collection of taxes and you can lien property for taxes. We don't have the same rights with stormwater unless you're one of the seven or eight municipalities that statute recognizes. Um, one of the options is to, to lobby to be included in that list so that if it's on the tax bill, people don't pay, then it doesn't. Currently, it would have to be subordinate to taxes. So any, any money collected by the tax office would go to taxes first and then to stormwater fees. So it's a little bit of a challenge to um, in the scenario where people don't fully pay the entire bill to break that out and then be be able to follow the legal process to lien for taxes. What if somebody this year refuses to pay? What happens? Well, we as I mentioned earlier, we have we're estimating an 85% collection. Um, we will have a, a a mechanism to provide a late payment penalty. Um, there's some limitations in statute for what you can charge for um late payment so we'll follow whatever the statute says we can legally do in, in trying to collect that money but ultimately we can't collect it if someone refuses yeah we anticipate there some bad debt okay the reason i mentioned this tax uh billing was because it's 99.78 percent mm -hmm. a collection right compared to 85 you know i'm yeah. just Exactly the reason that was my first choice because it, you know probably 50% of the folks have a mortgage on something and the mortgage company sure. collects and so you're you're you have much more payment assurance in, in that scenario but um, the end of the day the county wasn't able to accommodate us this fiscal year they do their billing in the um, summer even though we don't it's not due until January end of the year but um, it just they can't make it don't happen. pay we'll send the chief. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's not. <laughs> Any other questions right now? Okay, so uh, we've talked about the uh, expansion budget and the police presentation. Fee schedule is the next thing. You, you're all aware that every year we review our fee schedule and formally adopt that as part of the budget. So um, you, you have a copy of what the proposed fee schedule will be next year. There are a few additions under planning and zoning for um, stormwater review fee and a few other things that um, we don't currently charge for. Uh, these are recommendations that planning director has made and, and Shannon's reviewed so we're asking to include these fees on our fee schedule and we've also added the stormwater utility fee structure to that. Uh, the things in yellow are um, represent changes. Sure, I got one question I'll hush about the stormwater. I know before when we went to, I had to come up here and get a zoning line of terms and go to the county. And they done the stormwater and uh, issued me a permit for building. Oh, is that going to be a twofold thing now? I'm going to be double stormwater? That's going to change in the next month. We, we're doing the, the, re the review and the inspections for stormwater after 
next month, right? We, it's going to be, yes, pro probably beginning around June 1. Okay. So, but, it, uh, okay. So, I'm, so Currently, I'm yes, we would provide the zoning compliance. And, and a stormwater for them to take to the county. No, we'll do the stormwater and issue the stormwater permit. Okay, how am I going to get a county permit? You don't need to get a county permit. But the county won't issue me a permit without it. That it'll, that information will be given to Probably the county, so okay. they'll okay. add it to the oh, information on their portal. You mean you won't get your building permit? Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. You would have to just like they would need a verification that or be approved the zoning permit. They would need verification to get their zoning. Okay. Okay. I was just confused. I didn't know exactly. So any parcel in Woodfin, uh, if there's a stormwater component, the authorization would come from us instead of the current stormwater administrator at the county well you know before goodson done it and they wouldn't re the buncombe county wouldn't issue me a permit until my stormwater was done mm -hmm. and i didn't want them to hold it now till we're done if that makes any sense question yes sir um, community center reservation a deposit of 525 dollars that seems awfully steep i understand the reason for it but if you're going to have a family reunion, somebody's got to come up with almost a thousand bucks to use our community center. That just seems, that seems almost like a deterrent. Well, we, we have a cleaning service that we have to pay every time somebody uses the community center. So part of that rental fee covers, most of the rental fee covers that. Right. And then the deposit, you know, we, it was much more of a problem when we allowed alcohol at the facility. There have been a number of times, just several months ago recently, where we came in and there was a bathroom stall torn down and uh, glass broken all over the floor and the microwave door was messed up and just one thing after another. And, and, and we hold that money to I understand. Um, so that if we have to do intensive cleaning or repairs, um, most of those deposits are paid on credit card now, and as soon as we get the okay from the cleaning service, we just refund that on the credit card. Um, but, it, you know. The council authorized me to, to be able to waive fees. Um, That's true. Well back. And, and I've, I've applied this to the process as well. Okay, good. So I've reduced deposit requirements based on, you know, what the proposed use was. Like, if you're doing meetings and it's not a party, I don't think Okay, good. Thank you. That helps. I appreciate that. And now that there's no alcohol, they don't have to have an officer, correct? Yeah, and some of the nonprofits do make that request. We always send those requests to Shannon, and and um, sh she weighs in on what the appropriate charge should be. And, and no, if there's no alcohol, we don't require an officer at the facility. One more question. On site, a police officer, $60 for our management. Then down here it says off duty police officer fifty dollars a hour. So the the first one is for a, a special event fee, so that if there is a parade in Woodfin or a uh, festival of some sort that um, requires police services, then that the fee is a little bit higher. Okay. Okay. So if I just want one to set my driveway, it's fifty dollars a hour. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And, <laughs> and why? <laughs> yeah. So, um, any other questions about the fee schedule? Okay. Moving on to fund balance. Um, the, so the burning question at the end of the day for, for finance folks is: if we make all these adjustments, how is that going to affect our bottom line? And then that's the reason we keep going back to fund balance uh, on. The town's books fund balance represents your retained earnings or your savings that, um, and I'm going to go back to that slide, that, that we have to have for a rainy day to provide contingencies, um, credit worthiness so that when we go to borrow money, if we don't have some adequate savings, we don't get very good interest rates if they're willing to loan to us at all. Um, to provide cash flow, um, I've mentioned to the council a number of times that our Revenue is not linear like expenditures are, that we get most of our taxes in the middle of the year, December, January, February. So we have to have some reserves to fund town operations in the other times of the year and, and what have you. Um, so our projection, and these um, are, are simply estimates based on the information we have today. Um, who knows how they'll actually end up, but I, I believe 
that we have a very good handle on where we'll end up at the end of the fiscal year. So, so I believe these numbers are pretty close. Um, revenue should come in at around $7.5 million. Expenditures at about 7.7. .7. Um, I'll remind you that we budgeted a million and a half dollars in fund balance. So we had thought if we did everything we had in the budget, we'd come in at about a million and a half dollars. That $260,000 would be 1.5 million. We've had some additional revenues for sales tax primarily and a little bit in property taxes and done a little better in some expenditure lines. We've had some open positions and things that we didn't have to pay for. So the um, net decrease in fund balance is only, only going to be around $260,000 at the end of this fiscal year. Um, that includes all the carry for items that I mentioned earlier in the expansion budget, the salt shed, um, any of the feasibility study money we don't spend, the truck for public works. So w I'll present you with a budget amendment in probably early August to roll those things into the new budget if we haven't spent them by that time. But those are already accounted for in that number as being fully expended. Um, the base budget for 2024 is currently sits with everything that we've talked about in these budget workshops at 7.1 million in revenue and 6.8 million in expenditures. That provides a positive fund balance contribution of 273,000. The expansion items we talked about today are an additional 717,000. So your total recommended budget for 2024, if we make no changes from where it sits today, will, will be the 7.1 million in revenue and 7.5 in expenditures. So the, the 444 reduction in fund balance will, uh, it's the 717 minus the 273 that we would have if we made none of the expansion changes. Any questions about that? So we, we talked about this. Um, we all know our fund balance target is right at 50%. And if we keep everything in the budget that we have talked about so far, we'll end up, when all the dust settles, at about 47% fund balance. Uh, that's still a pretty healthy number for a town our size. Uh, we, we have some uh, large projects in the works and on the horizon with the park, some of the uncertainties around funding there, and with the town hall project that's coming up. So we'll need to be very vigilant as we approach the, some decisions in the next fiscal year. As we go into 2024, a lot of the decisions regarding the parks and funding and some of those big obligations will have been made. We'll finish our feasibility study for town hall. So we won't get around to committing or spending any of that town hall money until we know where we are with the park. So my comfort level with this number is, is pretty high. Um, but just say that we'll proceed through the next year with a lot of caution and vigilance and, and advising you and how we think we should make those decisions as we move forward. Does that make sense? So the wild card is the park yeah. project. And, um, but the town hall is the expensive expansion budget item. So we will be prepared to pull the plug on the town hall moving to the next step in the event that we find ourselves in a bad position with the park. But if things go well with funding that gap in the park, then we should feel comfortable moving forward with town hall. So it's, it's a way to kind of budget and plan, but um, have some some ability to, to shift our course. I saw that we were granted the 35000 what are we hearing about the other three possibilities that will help cut We actually down got the, the 35 today or yesterday. Yeah, exactly. So that's, that's so, already in the bank. So, you know, 35 is wonderful, but, in but the, in the others are bigger. Yeah. Gap, yeah. So, unfortunately, we won't really get to that. So, we won't know. Um, one, one of our strongest hopes is that when we go to bid, the bids will come in under. Um, we won't know that until we go to bid. So we're trying to figure out the funding strategy so that the project's fully funded in order to go to bid. Um, we haven't 
uh, the, the conversation with the county hasn't really advanced any further, but there's still work to be done on that front. We are still awaiting um, an answer regarding the one very large grant for the Land and Water Conservation Fund that is pending. That's a $500,000 grant. Our grant writer did reach out to the funders to ask if they could update us on a schedule when we might know. Um, the response was very noncommittal. <laughs> in terms of when we would know. They, they indicated that they were awaiting funding from uh, National Park Service before they made their announcements. Um, the part of the communication that troubled me is that they said, this is round two that we're currently waiting for. And they said, well, if you're not funded in round two, we'll automatically roll you into round three. So um, that was a little disappointing. I don't know, I don't, you know, the individual responding if they knew what our position was at all in, in, the, uh, you know, in terms of the likelihood of being funded. Um, I think I mentioned before, we, we were feeling relatively optimistic because they did come back to us and ask for a lot more additional information. So we felt that that was a positive sign, but we don't know. And unfortunately, they won't tell us when we will know. Given the, the seriousness of it, have you been thinking about a, a plan of how to approach the county again for some additional funding? Yeah, um, I have. And I think the first step is to try to get an appointment with the county manager. And I was going to, rather than try to work directly with her, I was going to try to reach out to her assistant and get on her calendar that way. Probably invite Sherry um, into that meeting conversation as well. Unfortunately, we lost two real good key players at the county that were in big favor of the town of Ludford. And that's going to be hard to make up. They were really pushing us, and now we're not being pushed. <laughs> um, I appreciate council members who have kind of reached out as well. Um, I think the, the more voices that they hear from, um, you know, I think the, the perhaps the stronger our position will be. So. Did I interrupt your closing one? That was about it. Um, so we've gone over everything that I had today. As we mentioned earlier, the 16th of this month, we'll formally present the recommended budget to the board, to the council, and uh, we'll set our public hearing for the 20th of June. Um, and that's, we, we await your discussion and instructions. On the expansion budget in particular, or? But the expansion budget or, or anything else budget-wise you'd like to discuss. So I'll just note that on the police adding a position, I'd, I'd support that this time. There was mention made of a potential future lieutenant position as well. Uh, unless we see kind of sizable population growth, I don't know that that would be justified. Um, the that PBL group recommended both positions, but yeah. the budget really just could not accommodate two positions at this time. Um, we, we had a roundtable discussion with the group, as Jonathan mentioned, uh, as part of our budget planning process, and the chief and the members of that board, Shannon and I, were, were in the room, and we asked them if they could prioritize their request and the things that they thought would be most impactful and if they could only get one position, what would it be? And this is um, based on their recommendations. Yeah, the, the problem with the peer municipality selection that we we're looking at is that North Carolina as a whole has a higher rate of officers per capita than the average nationwide. Um, that's the starting place. Um, we are already above the national average for uh, police per capita. Um, that I'm able to find. It's, some of that data is pretty old, but I think that actually probably skews to the favor of the department because that's before the policing shortages really hit and took hold. So um, that's the, the, the current rate that we're going to be at, which I think is 19 sworn officers, if we can fill this new position, is as high as I can justify internally looking at the data for what we have now versus the population, not relative to other municipalities in this immediate region, but nationwide. So I, I can be supportive of what's proposed here, um, but I can tell you right now that I, I'd be looking uh, very hard at the at any additional positions from here on. Good to know. Anybody else have any other concerns or observations they'd like to make? Just the um, 
so for the accounting on the town hall yeah. so I, I understand why it's identified as part of the expansion budget we've also talked about it as part of our capital budget and we've looked at the debt service that may be required on a large project like that we're proposing to take 300,000 essentially and and out of the general fund towards that capital project too so it, it's less in my mind an actual uh, it's not it's not totally consistent with the way we've been talking about it to consider it as a general fund allocation in my mind we've got a, a, a number in mind for the total project cost and we're looking at debt servicing for that um, if we're going to eat 300,000 of that potential project cost through this allocation so, so the first uh, what we discussed when we had our capital uh, meeting the first million and a half dollars of that project was out of pocket so mm -hmm. general fund contribution so generally you pay your out of pocket first and then you do your debt financing at the end because that's less interest but um, so, so that's why but it at the end of the day all the debt service and the out of pocket cost would be general fund contribution dollars I just get, I guess I just didn't recall seeing it broken out in like year by year that we would be it wouldn't be 1.5 million up front as a general fund allocation it's we're, here's a three hundred thousand dollar chunk of that right right now those slides that I included today um, came from last month's presentation mm -hmm. and I, I here they are yeah last month I had 750 this uh, in 2024 and 750 in 2025 on the CIP schedule, okay. um, which is the million and a half, and then the debt service of estimated six and a half million. Who knows what that number will be once we get the feasibility study? It could be several million dollars less or more, but um, for estimation purposes, that was our best guess, and um, we whittled that down once we really took a look at the timing after we met with the folks who will be doing the feasibility study and talked about their timeline um, and looked at the calendar for next year um, and and the budget for, for this year and that was really all we were comfortable committing to um, and like I said that's we're asking for the appropriation but we won't make that commitment until after the feasibility process, and you all will be the determining factor in whether or not we move forward with that project. 2025 is a revaluation year, so we're op cautiously optimistic that when we, if we are able to stay on track with town hall and the park and everything, that you know by 2025 we'll be in a position to be able to continue work on town hall. And get started. There's some normal growth every year, and then 25 is a revaluation year which you usually see about a 10 percent bump or we saw a little more last time we had a revaluation so um we think that um we'll, we'll stay on track if the numbers don't really change from what our estimates are but. we have some miscellaneous real estate that can be sold um i don't know why we're sitting on some of it that one residential parcel yeah. well, List it tomorrow. Why not? Yeah. I had a hard time finding it, but once I did, I'm like, somebody will buy this. Beautiful place. I agree. And your uh, conversation at the last board meeting was really helpful. I think we will probably need to end up spinning off some property at some Good. point um, to help fund the project. One time down on uh, Weaver Highway, the town, town out there on the little piece of property down there. That little building, uh, I think it was an old coal yard or something one time. The one where the man started the new house that's got the steel structure there on the left headed toward Moe's. And that, that's as far as he ever got. And is that what that is? That yeah. was going to be a res of a Yeah, he's going to put a house there. Right. He was a, he was a uh, artist. Yeah. He was going to put it on and he built that structure and it. That's what he did. He built a structure. I think it would be. And we own that parcel right. now. No. The next no. building, I think, belongs to the town. I didn't know that. I'm not sure. What yeah. yeah. was red building. The old next to Nino's. Nino's car. That red building. No, that belongs to. Uh, it's not on that sheet of real estate. Oh, Rocky. Yeah. Zip on. Okay. Yeah. At one time, the town owned that. I think. There's a piece down. I'll look it up. There's a piece down there somewhere. I'll find it and get back. 
Now, I don't know why the town's keeping them, why we don't sell them. It's just a small. You find it, we'll sell it. <laughs> well, uh, you know, it ain't going to bring no million dollars for sure, but I, the million I have deaths in the parts. Whatever it brings is more than we got today. Exactly. Yeah. Put it back on the tax roll. The parts. Yeah. Got me worried. It is committed. And we've seen today every every thirty thousand, every fifty thousand to make a difference. And oh yeah. Like well, that residential got that, lot. Got that piece up there on top of uh, the old Marshall Highway too. Yeah. yeah. That's landlocked. That's the only problem with it. The person on the north side might be interested in that. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. So some of the parcels that we own really aren't. It just scared me. You know, we're we're committed to the park, and we're shortfall pretty good amount. And uh, without knowing for sure with the grants and different, but you know, we got to find that. Uh, I just don't want the town to get in trouble. We're hopeful that all that will resolve itself before we get back. to make decisions on the town hall. Yeah. And we may want to consider making some noise in public about the gap in the park and shaming some others into trying to shaming them into considering some additional help. Yeah, they committed and need to follow through now. Yeah. And everything's gone up, so give us some more. Well, it'll certainly be a community resource, not just a woodfin resource. Exactly. So. But along Jim's lines, if we advertise more, maybe we'll get some private donations coming in, some more different. Uh, they, we, we've done awful good in the onset with the um, fundraiser and different things that Mark Hunt was involved in, the kayakers and all that um, brought in quite a bit of money. Heck, let's do it again. That's been... I think there is, so that is part of the strategy to close okay. the gap is to do fundraising and we're really going to help with that. Okay. They would very much like us to try to identify elements to fundraise for. So that's been part of the conversation. I didn't mention it this time, but part of that funding strategy also to be able to do a bid is to do what's called an ad alt for the bid, um, which would be identify certain elements that you would add in should the, should the bids come in low enough. So we would look at like what pieces could be separated out and then Riverland could fundraise for that or as money becomes available, they get added back into the project. Okay, any other questions? Right. Good job, thank you. Thank you all for your time. Yeah, thanks thank everybody. You. Thank you. Okay, hearing no further questions, uh, to have a motion, we adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Yeah. Aye.